My name is Matt, welcome back to the shop, and today we're talking about uh, oil levels and crankshafts because there's a lot of questions from the video I just did recently about uh, knife edging. We're going to talk a bit more about that because people seem to um, be a bit confused, but that's for a separate video. In this video, we're going to talk about oil levels. Now, before we talk about oil levels, there is a few facts that we need to get out of the way to make it just easier to understand. So, number one is that. Um, your, the, the system, like I said, let's understand the system. So you have a sump, you have a pickup tube, you'll have a pump. This will piss out into an oil filter. So that's a filter. And then basically what will happen is, is this gets pumped back into your main gallery. Like so, your main gallery is a long, basically a, a, dr a drilling all the way through your block. And then you have if you've got a four cylinder, you'll have feeds or two or one, depends what bike it is, or engine it is, should I say. And uh, these galleries feed your crank bearings. There's also a drain off this that goes up to your head. So that goes up to your head, like so. Can you see that? Yeah, you can just make that out. Um, so, all this has a volume. Your filter, well, I've got a filter, filler, filler, wee. Your filter, this is a K&N jobby, <coughs> for some tests about this weld. Um, how big is that? It's the same size as this can in diameter. What's this can? 400 milliliters. Ah, it's about 250. Let's just say it's 250. So there's 250 milliliters in there. That's a shit way of writing 250. <laughs> but, uh, haha! The, um,. Yeah, so you've got a volume of oil in here. Now, this is never always full. There is a drain back valve to stop it completely emptying, but it's not always full. Um, just because of where the attachment point sits, where your feeds are. I'll go through that more in a, a filter video. <laughs> but basically, all these things have volumes. You know, your main gallery with all the... There are only little drill, drilled holes and all the rest of it, but this could easily be... I don't know, 500, it's probably not, but 500 millilitres for the whole thing. Because you've got your head feeds, you've got just bloody everything. There's all there's cross drillings everywhere. Obviously there's also the ones that go to your gearbox, stuff like that. Um, so what happens is, this is point number one, is that when you start your engine, your oil level will instantly drop. You'll just see it drop. If you look at the window, start the bike up, you'll see that oil level disappear below the window. So that's number one. Is your oil level, your static oil level, your static oil level is always the highest it's going to be. When you look through your window, use a dipstick, whichever um, measurement device that you have. The second thing we need to understand about um, your oiling system in relation to what we're talking about, about the oil level. <coughs> is architecture. Is that spell architecture? No. <laughs> How the bloody love I spell that? <laughs> oh shit. Well, we're leaving this in. Ah. Uh, oh, it's an I. I, I was looking at that E and going, what? Architecture. And there's a C missing, you idiot. Fucking hell. Let me write it properly. Architecture. There we go. Sometimes the brain mush. <laughs> and it's weird writing. Anyway, excuses, Matt. You're a fucking dumbass. Just say it. You learned how to read last week. Right, so. <laughs> the architecture of your engine is very important. I was saying this in the um, magnetic sump plug stuff like that. For those who don't speak English or for those who don't understand that architecture has anything to do with engines, basically it's where stuff is and how it's planned out. You can have PCB architecture, blah, 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 blah. It's just how you lay out things, basically. So the architecture of your engine, and this is a good point when we get back to um, oiling. The other thing we want to remember as well is, and it's back to this, is that um, it's, the it's a dynamic system. Dynamic fucking hell. Jesus Christ. Didn't have my Weetabix. I had Alpen, shouldn't have done it. 
<laughs> fucking bird seed. Uh, it's a dynamic system, so basically things are sloshing around, stuff's flying fucking everywhere. It's an oil system. Um, so with that in mind, the other thing we, or the, the fourth thing we need to remember here is that we have a rotating mass. Rotating mass, Jesus Christ. God. Fucking I need to find a window that I can lick. So we have a rotating mass, and the forces involved here are extremely, uh, they're, they're very, very high. So, with all that in mind, let's just say you had your oil. So your crankshaft is here, that's your centre line for your rotation, like so. Let's just say you have a sump and all that shite, and let's just say you have an oil level up here that your crank sits in. What the fucking hell would happen? It would probably never start. Why? Because it's trying to churn that crank through oil. There's one other thing you've got to remember, that you've got a crank pin. And this crank pin has a bloody great big conrod on it. Right? So the throws of your crankshaft, these throws like so, and your crank pin, and your centre line, these throws, if they're especially the full circle, which most are, they could just glide through the oil, there'd be a bit of um, friction who would care? It's when this um, crank pin and that conrod go poof and butt the oil. The worst thing is, as well, is imagine your oil level is here. I can't fucking hardly ever see that. When this crank pin here comes round, it's channeled. There are two uh, throws of your crankshaft. It's going to go poof. Now, it would push the oil out of the way, but it can only push it forwards and backwards. It would basically belly flop. That's just on startup. If you were still ploughing through oil, every time that crankshaft goes, every time that crank pin comes around, it would be slap, 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 slap. And when you really accelerate and stuff like that, <coughs> and you, you're you going fast, your engine's going 8,000 RPM, you slam on the brakes, you pull in the clutch and let the engine freewheel or something crazy like that. You shouldn't do that, you should leave your clutch out, but people do. And you slam on the front, the oil is going to shift. It's going to pull to the front like this because of the inertia that the oil has. The inertia is the resistance to change um, velocity. So basically, the bike is slowing down, but there's no brakes on the oil, so the oil slumps forward. Like if you do that in a bath, all the water goes to that end. Same kind of thing. So now your crank is going to go fucking ah -yah! straight into oil, and it's going to it will break stuff. It will shatter stuff. It will fuck your crank up, it will fuck your rods up, and your engine will die. So, no, <laughs> your engine does not butt into the oil. Now, on some Briggs and Stratton engines and stuff like that, and some old school engines, what they used to do is they used to use a splash system. Instead of having all these galleries and stuff, the engine's out under massive, massive amounts of load. They aren't going massively, massively fast. So what they used to have is they used to have, I'll see if I can find a picture of one, but they used to have a crankshaft with a little bit sticking out the bottom of it, which is part of the crankshaft, uh, conrod, sorry, not bloody crankshaft. And what that used to do is, that used to literally just kick up oil. But this is a thin little thing sticking out, and like I say, these engines aren't going mental. It is not this crank pin slamming into the oil. So, when we look at the other things, um, I've got some examples. I only got two because I've got the rest of my life to sit there and look through every single manual. <laughs> But uh, the SV, we'll choose the SV because why not? Um, I got a picture of the SV and you can see that there's the little window with its two marks and then your crank circles up here and I've put red lines on there where the oil level is. So that's where your oil level is. It is the highest point is below where the crankshaft is. Also, if you look at the cases where you can look in the manual, I'll see if I can get a picture of a real case. You can see there's a section of casing on the inside that sits there like so. This is, like I said, engine architecture. This is for when if you slam on, that pool of oil is basically stopped and it'll pull up against this, like so. It'll go bleh, and it'll stop it nutting into your crankshaft. Now, if you look at, um, I've got another one, which is a Z1000. Just thought I'd pick something a bit more, uh, not the norm, if you get one. I just thought I'd pick something newer. Uh, here's some pictures of the S1000, uh, Z1000, bloody hell fire. <laughs> the Z1000, you can see in this that um, 
you know the crankshaft is up here and the oil fill level again is down here and I've put two lines on it for minimum and maximum you can see basically that it's no fucking way near not only that if you actually look and I'll show you some pictures you can see that there's a wall between the transmission so your sumps here your gears are here with your selector and all it's probably I think it's tipped the other way but regardless it doesn't matter you've got your out and you're in, obviously your clutch sits on there. You can see your oil level there. They have two things. They have one, a windage tray, which is this thing you can see here in this picture. This basically just stops all that oil doing exactly that, sloshing around and getting too out of hand. Um, it has holes and when oil drips back down, it can make its way through those holes back into the sump. Um, windage trays are so-so. We'll go into them. In a sense, that's a separate thing and people think that's what uh, knife edging is about. We'll go, like I say, we're doing a video about knife edging on top of what I did because people got a bit confused, which is fair enough. But you can see here, the casing, there's a sump bit here. The, the crankshaft can easily drip down its oil back into the sump, but there's this wall, and that wall there, there's a hole in one side of it because it has to have the primary drive run through. But basically, there's a long big gaping hole. The caps, the journal caps that sit in here, are a bloody long way away from the bottom of this line of the cases. Um, again, the architecture of the engine, the internals of the engine are there to one, make it strong because it's a stress member, but number two, to also make, like I say, make these, in a sense, like baffles like you get in fuel tanks when stuff starts sloshing around and all the rest of it, especially when you're under braking because it all wants to go forward, there's nothing to stop it, and so on and so forth. Um, yes, if you excessively wheelie your bike for too long, uh, depending where your pickup tube is, if your pickup tube is at the back and you're wheeling it, well, it's not going to be much of a problem. If your pickup tube's towards the front, then yes, you are going to starve your engine out and probably start cooking it. <sighs> so, there's the other things as well. There's lots of people going to ask, well, how exactly does the crankshaft receive oil and stuff? That's a separate video because it's just a subject on its own. Um, but yes, if your crankshaft was to sit there butting oil, it would be absolutely catastrophic. There are things, and engine architecture is something that I'm really interested in, and I think it'll make some really interesting videos, because it's something that generally ghosts believe in. It's something that generally people don't understand, or even take notice of. Uh, as an example, we've been taking the piss out of the R3 boys, look at this picture here. That is engine architecture for um, basically oil and um, crankcase ventilation and emissions reasons but you can see that that's quite an intricate piece of kit it looks like all the passages and stuff you get in an automatic gearbox um but you see things like that are engine architecture and there's quite a few cool things that we can see with a few engines that i have um and stuff like that we can actually have a look at these things and see how these things work uh once we get tim's engine apart i'll show you the i'll basically do an entire video on the engine architecture of that engine it's not just where your cylinders go and where your gearbox sits there's a lot more to it than that. Hope that makes sense, and I'll see you in a bit.